Hello everyone, and thank you for joining us to learn more about how the liver may be affected when your child has PKD. I am Nicole Haar, Director of Community Engagement at the PKD Foundation, and I will be your host throughout the webinar. We will get started with the presentation in just a moment, but first I have a few announcements. Please note that the PKD Foundation does not offer medical advice and the information shared during this webinar is not intended to be a substitute for consultations with your health care professionals. All attendees will remain muted throughout the presentation to ensure good audio quality for all viewers. We are recording this webinar and will be posting the recording on our website within the next few days. If you have questions during the presentation, please type your questions into the question box located in your control panel on the right side of your screen. We will do our best to address as many questions as possible during the Q&A session immediately following the presentation. Please note, we will only address questions related to the webinar topic. If you have specific medical questions, please follow up with your healthcare team. I am delighted to introduce you to our speaker, Dr. Ryan Fisher. Dr. Fisher is a board certified pediatric gastroenterologist and transplant hepatologist at Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City. He has a strong interest in translational research related to liver disease and transplantation and novel therapeutics to treat disordered inflammation in the liver. Clinically, Dr. Fisher focuses on the diagnosis and treatment of liver disease in children with a great deal of time devoted to children that need or have undergone liver transplantation. Dr. Fisher is a Nebraska born and bred graduate of the University of Nebraska College of Medicine. While in medical school, he met and fell in love with a pediatric intensive care nurse who became his wife, and he also fell in love with caring for children with life-threatening liver and intestinal diseases that could require transplantation. After completing pediatric residency at Nationwide Children's Hospital in Columbus, Ohio, he headed to Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh to complete his pediatric gastroenterology and transplant hepatology fellowships at the renowned Transplant Center. After a brief stint back in Omaha, he was asked to join the team at Children's Mercy in Kansas City. Since arriving in Kansas City, he has worked with surgeons, physicians, and staff of the Liver Care Center to provide the region's best liver transplant medicine. Dr. Fisher, thank you for joining us to help us learn more about liver manifestations in children, and I am turning the presentation over to you. Sounds good. Thank you so much, Nicole. Again, my name is Ryan. Uh, I am one of the liver docs here at Children's Mercy in Kansas City. Um, it is uh, an absolute pleasure uh, to take part in this webinar, and I can only thank uh, the staff for their efforts uh, at the PKD Foundation. Uh, I'm certain without it, uh, families, uh, patients, and providers alike would have far less resources than we do today. Um, as noted, I am a liver doc, not a kidney doc, and one of the big things that we know about polycystic kidney disease, specifically the autosomal recessive forms in children, but occasionally the autosomal dominant forms as well, is that it's not always just about the kidney and that certainly the liver can become injured, damaged, or otherwise fibrotic or even cirrhotic as part of the disease itself. So what we're going to do today is review what we call congenital hepatic fibrosis, which is scarring that happens in the liver often associated with ARPKD. Um, we're gonna talk about what it is, how it happens, and then how it associates with ARPKD. Um, and we're gonna discuss key components of it, including not only how you inherit this um, and why it shows up in some kids and not others, but also some long-term complications of, fibro of congenital hepatic fibrosis as well. And certainly uh, with my interest in transplantation, we'll talk about not only the transplant of the liver if it's significantly fibrotic, but also maybe future therapies that can be helpful. So really, what is CHF? Well, it's a developmental disorder of the portobiliary system characterized by defective remodeling of the ductal plate, abnormal branching of the intrahepatic portal veins, and progressive fibrosis of the portal tracts. Um, okay, basically the bile ducts, which take bile from the liver to the intestine, and then the veins that surround them, didn't form right, and I hope that makes it a little more simple. The whole thing is supposed to develop right around one month of gestation, so before 
someone might even know they're pregnant. These things have been going on inside the developing fetus. But we get a, you know, a rudimentary gut tube that begins to develop. And from that, we can see that the hepatic ducts begin to stick out into the surrounding cells. And those begin to talk with those surrounding cells, turning those surrounding cells into the liver um, around the ducts themselves. When it's all done, those liver cells should be surrounding a nice set of bile ducts, kind of looking like the roots of a tree going all throughout the liver and helping the hepatocytes or those liver cells to drain bile into the intestine where it belongs. Uh, this is a great process. We love having bile in our intestines to help us digest fats and proteins. But at the same time, it uh, may not always go right. And congenital hepatic fibrosis is when that remodeling of those bile ducts, which happens uh, around 35 days of age, goes wrong. And on this picture here, I believe I have my arrow, I do, we'll see that the vein is developing in concert with the bile duct. And normally we get some bile ductules forming around this vein. And as the liver matures, normally you get some nicely shaped ductules surrounding that nice vein. But in congenital hepatic fibrosis, something goes wrong related to the formation of those bile ducts. And we have these disordered, uh, abnormal ducts surrounding it, which begin to become very fibrotic and lead to all the chronic changes that we see in the liver. Um, even if you're not a great scientist, you can see that one of these things is not like the other. And if I was to do a liver biopsy in someone with a normal liver, I would see a lot of nice kind of pink looking hepatocytes or liver cells surrounding a portal vein. And you might find a bile duct sitting right next to it. And that looks great. There's a little bit of fibrous tissue, but not much. When you go into congenital hepatic fibrosis, you see all these crazy looking bile ducts and then a bunch of fibrous tissue trying to hold them all together in, in different ways. And it becomes uh, very fibrotic, very scarred, and eventually doesn't function as well as it needs to. So when you see congenital hepatic fibrosis, uh, you tend to see those abnormal ducts not only on biopsy, but you can also see them on the images that we take. And again, over on the left, here's actually here's a nice looking gallbladder uh, nearby uh, the bile duct that takes the bile from the liver into the intestine, and this all looks pretty good. In this liver with congenital hepatic fibrosis, you see that it's a larger liver extending all the way across the body and that you actually have these big cystic dilatations all throughout this liver uh, where those abnormal bile ducts have become very filled with bile. It can definitely get pretty nasty. And this is an example of a liver taken out of someone who had congenital hepatic fibrosis. And you can see these big dilated ducts scattered all throughout. You can see a real dark appearance to the liver as well. That's from bile that's uh, not getting out as easily as it should. And you can see kind of a almost lumpy appearance. That's the scarring or the cirrhosis that you can see in someone who's had uh, their congenital hepatic fibrosis for some time. And again, this is just what it might look like on a CT scan where you see those big dilated areas scattered throughout the liver. So can we actually explain how this happens? And shortly, it's, it's a pretty poorly understood uh, genetic issue. We often see it's related to mutations in the ARPKD gene, which is that PKHD1 that I know everyone is quite familiar with, um, where one in 70 in the United States can be carriers and one in 10,000 are affected. On a side note, it can very rarely be associated with the PKD1 or 2 gene as well. And we have seen some case reports where very similar congenital hepatic fibrosis appearance can happen in autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease as well. Congenital hepatic fibrosis can be found uh, not only with ARPKD, however, we see it in a number of different syndromes where the gene that's affected, whether it's chromosome 9, 2, 4, 2, 11, can be quite different. But at the same time, the end result is uh, very similar or the same, where that liver has big dis dilated and disordered bile ducts and a lot of fibrosis. Now, 
I, I should kind of make sure that I'm I'm specific with all this and that congenital hepatic fibrosis uh, is also referred to as Corolli disease or Corolli syndrome. And really these are all kind of part of the same continuum, the same family of fibrocystic liver disease that we see. So if we're gonna be really specific, congenital hepatic fibrosis is really just the fibrosis of the liver um, where you get a hard, abnormal liver. Um, Corolli disease is where you can get some dilatations of these bile ducts, perhaps not without as much fibrosis and usually not associated with any other liver abnormality. Now, Corolli syndrome gives you the ductal dilatation and the large fibrotic liver. And this is what uh, we often see with uh, ARPKD if we're gonna be um, most specific. But I really you know, think that if we say fibrocystic liver disease or congenital hepatic fibrosis, we're all basically speaking the same language. Um, progression of congenital hepatic fibrosis is due to a combination of things. So you have to have the right genetics. You have to get some inflammation uh, to increase scarring, and we'll see that scarring happen. Um, and you have to get some cysts that can grow and perpetuate not only the inflammation, but also the laying down of scar tissue. And we know this happens pretty quickly. I mean, if we look at the first three months of life, we see that there's evidence of uh, RNA and DNA and other signals that in a polycystic kidney disease kid are already elevated beyond someone else who would otherwise have a normal liver. So this is happening not only in the fetus, but also right after delivery. Unfortunately, we have not figured out a way to halt progression of the fibrosis or repair what we're seeing. And so we really focus on long-term management in our children that have uh, congenital hepatic fibrosis. We do recommend immunization for hepatitis A and B. This becomes important because the worst thing you could do if you have a liver disease is put another liver disease on top of it. I always talk to patients, it's not one plus one equals two, it's one plus one equals four. And so you just get, everything becomes a lot worse than you would normally expect when you add them together like that. You do have to be careful to monitor growth development and nutrition, especially in kids. Um, this is a big point in our liver program where we wanna see children grow and develop as close to normal as possible. If this requires calorie supplementation, vitamin supplementation, we wanna do what it takes because when that liver doesn't work right, that's your body's factory. Um, it's taking in all the nutrients that the intestine gives it. And if it can't make the right proteins or everything that it needs, growth and development can suffer. Of course, you always want to avoid alcohol. Um, you want to avoid obesity because that can lead to fatty liver disease, diabetes, uh, and sometimes in advanced congenital hepatic fibrosis, you want to avoid uh, anything that might uh, be like an ibuprofen or a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory because these can inhibit platelets and make it easier to bleed. And then we'll talk a little bit later about it, but uh, we do in general recommend avoidance of contact sports um, I tend to tell my parents not to do helmeted sports, but I'll get you some data here in a bit. Um, we know that not in addition to vitamins, uh, that you might need antibiotics to prevent infection from happening in those big dilated bile ducts where bacteria can hang out. You might also need something to kind of take some of the inflammatory stress on the liver, off the liver. And we call these our choleretic agents, um, things like uh, ursodiol, which kind of help the bile get out of the bile ducts a little bit and also reduce the production of it. Um, these things can all be part of the medications that a liver doctor might prescribe for your child, especially if they're noticing advancing disease. So, hey, you've got congenital hepatic fibrosis. What could possibly go wrong? Well, like we've talked about, you get a lot of fibrous tissue and that fibrous and scarred tissue can become cirrhotic. And they've done a nice job in this cartoon of showing kind of the lumpy bumpy nature of what a liver might look like. This cirrhosis can lead to portal hypertension. And so what you'll see here is, uh, is you really wanna focus on these dark navy blood vessels. These are the blood vessels coming from the intestines, bringing all those good nutrients to the liver. When the liver's all beat up, that blood has a hard time flowing through these veins easily. And it kinda, and it begins to get backed up. And so what you'll see is that the blood kinda goes, uh, whoops, let me go back decides to go a little bit back this way, back this way, and back this way. The intestines can kind of handle it, but when you go down these paths into the spleen, you'll see your spleen gets bigger, and we'll talk about that a little bit. 
And over here into the stomach and into the food pipe, these veins get bigger and they can bleed. So we can see some complications, what we call bleeding varices for these big blood vessels, splenomegaly or a large spleen, and occasionally a lot of liquid in the abdomen or what we call ascites can all be big complications of this cirrhotic liver. So if you do have congenital hepatic fibrosis, you can develop these big blood vessels. Uh, we can see uh, GI bleeding associated with that scarred up or cirrhotic liver, and uh, these can be severe. This is a picture of a scope going down the food pipe and kind of looking at those big blood vessels. If you can imagine a normal view, the esophagus or that food pipe should look like this, nice and smooth. But in this one, we see these big, large vessels coming up. And those, uh, even on this picture, you can see that some of them have a tendency to, to leak blood or even uh, bleed enough where you, your child could throw up and have uh, blood come out, which is always a, a scary event for, for parents and patients. So while they're difficult, these are definitely manageable issues. With our scopes, we can go down and if we do see these blood vessels, we can actually put um, a plastic cap on the end of our scope. We suck the blood vessel in and we put a rubber band around it so that it uh, looks like kind of this little mushroom shape with that rubber band. And after one or two days, that uh, blood vessel will necrose or kind of die off and uh, slough into the intestine and uh, and will be a lot less likely to bleed on you. Um, so that's one of those things that we may uh, do or your hepatologist may recommend. And we know that if your child does have significant congenital hepatic fibrosis associated with their polycystic kidney disease, which happens in anywhere, it depends on what your report you read, anywhere from 10 to 50% of kids affected by the disease, they get these complications. And so for those children that do have congenital hepatic fibrosis, we see that one of the most common ones is that they can develop the varices. Now, not de developing the varices doesn't mean they'll bleed, as we see that GI bleeding happens in the lesser percentage, but still happens at, at a pretty good clip. We'll also talk about cholangitis, which is the infection of those unusual bile ducts, additional renal injury, or even the ne uh, need for transplant which affects about 50% of uh, older children who've had some form of uh, severe uh, hepatic fibrosis affect them. So um, again, it's a, it's a big deal when it is when it is noted. So, you know, in general, is there anything else that we really need uh, to watch out for? And uh, we'll just give this gentleman a little time to uh, show us, uh, you know, is there anything we should be aware of? And well, there we go, all right. Um, so yeah, there is. Uh, well, what happens if my field child has a fever and could it be a liver infection? Um, we call that cholangitis. Um, and that's, uh, as this cartoon illustrates, an infection of the biliary tract. And now they've got it because uh, in this cartoon because of a stone, which kind of blocks the ducts and allows the bile to stay back in here. But oftentimes we see it because these, these intrahepatic bile ducts or these bile ducts inside the liver are dilated and, and really filled with fluid. And what can happen is you can get a fever, you can turn a little bit yellow because bile has a hard time getting out and that bile has bilirubin in it. And that bilirubin can turn uh, your skin and eyes yellow. And you get pain over on the right side where your liver is. Um, and that can be something that would need to be treated with antibiotics, especially because the bacteria that can get in there can be uh, pretty uh, nasty little bugs um, and can lead to intensive care stays and, and certainly if left alone too long, um, even death. So these uh, dilated bile ducts that you can see in someone that might have congenital hepatic fibrosis are a reservoir for possible infection. And you know, this I always kind of talk to parents that they're kind of like a bacterial hot tub um, where that bacteria can hang out and grow and divide, and invite friends and, and, and become really problematic. Um, so again, that uh, antibiotics are important to treat those things when they're noticed. So what if the belly becomes a lot more full? And uh, it's not just because you've been hanging out too long with this guy. Well, as we as we mentioned, when that liver is uh, is a big kind of scarred up and, and and nodular liver, you can get leakage of fluid into the belly and out uh, leakage of fluid out from the intestines because that that blood's kind of being pushed back this way and that fluid goes with it. We call that ascites, and it can make a child or an adult almost look like they're pregnant um, with how distended their abdomen can get. And so occasionally 
um, will need to go and drain that fluid. Um, that can be done with a needle into the abdomen, <coughs> excuse me, um, and we'll test it to make sure there's no bacteria living in here. Of course, if there is, uh, you'll want to treat it with antibiotics. And to help manage the fluid, uh, we do sometimes use diuretics, though, of course, that's always, uh, you know, something that needs to be managed in concert with the renal team to make sure uh, we're not doing something that can hurt the kidneys too much either. Um, so for all these complications, uh, do we have ways to manage them? And, and certainly we do. Um, if you have big, uh, if you have a lot of portal hypertension and you have a lot of varices, occasionally we recommend a blood pressure medication like a beta blocker. Uh, again, we'll talk to the renal team and you know see, hey, is, is this kiddo hypertensive anyway? Do they need another agent? This is one of our favorite ones. We'll sometimes use acid blockers, which decrease acid in the stomach. And we think they prevent the acid from eroding into those big blood vessels and causing them to bleed a little bit more. So that can be helpful. When it comes to those infections, we'll definitely recommend IV antibiotics to control uh, whatever bug we might find. Um, or if we don't find a bug, uh, say in the blood or in the bile ducts themselves, we'll just use broad antibiotics to help cover it for a few days before we switch over to oral and finish therapy. And then we'll also put patients on prophylactic antibiotics, give them a dose of Bactrim every day as a, as a good way to try and prevent any bacteria from climbing into those dilated bile ducts. When it comes to ascites, a lot of times salt restriction can be quite helpful. And as I mentioned before, diuretics. And then kind of some of those miscellaneous medicines, ursodiols, that choleretic that we talked about earlier, this one stops uh, or holds off on the formation of um, uh, for lack of a better term, kind of our more um, uh, damaging bile acids that our liver makes every day and instead replaces it with ursodiol, which is a little less uh, damaging uh, bile salt. It's one that's a little more water soluble, and so it's easier to get out, and therefore we don't have to make as much of our own. Um, and then certainly vitamins, especially fat soluble vitamins. These are what, you know, we talked about the liver uh, is, a, is a big factory. Um, it, uh, it, it wants those fats to come in. The bile that it makes helps digest those fats. If the bile isn't getting out easily, um, fats don't get digested well. And there's vitamins like vitamin A, D, and E, and K that uh, need fat and need fat digestion to be absorbed. So those things uh, can be hard to come by. But a visit to the liver doc can help. Um, and what we can do uh, is certainly a great exam uh, for your child, seeing if we can feel the spleen. As I mentioned, that spleen gets big with advanced liver disease, so we'll look for that. And we'll look for maybe a prominent blood vessels on the abdomen, which can be a sign that, again, the, the liver's beat up and not allowing blood through as easily as it should. Um, we'll check labs. We do look for platelet count quite often because when the spleen is big, the platelet count will be low as these platelets can get trapped in the spleen. We'll look at the INR, which is a measure of coagulation, and see if that number is normal. Uh, if the liver is really advanced and really damaged, it won't make proteins as well as it should. And the first proteins that we notice that may be low are the proteins related to blood clotting. And so we can measure that with an INR. Of course, we'll check a bilirubin. The bilirubin is high. That means bile, which uh, helps contain the bilirubin, isn't getting out of the liver. And the GGT is an enzyme that comes from the bile ducts uh, and the cells of the bile ducts themselves tends to be quite elevated in kids. Ultrasound or an MRI are great studies to get a good look at the liver. Um, I haven't shown you too many ultrasounds, but you have seen some MRIs already, um, which, which give great detail about the bile ducts. And then we do screening endoscopies as part of uh, the workup when we're suspicious of advancing liver disease. And that's to get a good look inside the food pipe and make sure that uh, there's no esophageal varices there. So really it's no one test that uh, says whether or not your kid has uh, advancing or worrisome liver disease in the setting of their polycystic kidney disease, but putting them all together can certainly help predict and aid the prognosis of what might be going on. We have some great technologies, um, including some non-invasive imaging techniques that allow us to really assess what's happening in the liver. I showed you that biopsy before, but a biopsy requires a needle going into your uh, a child's abdomen to take small pieces of the liver so we can look at it under the microscope. Um, while we do give medication and sometimes even let the kids sleep while we do the biopsy, 
uh, there's risk factors involved, including bleeding and pain that might go along with it. So we've developed ultrasound techniques. Here's, here's a good shot of that, where they can go ahead and not only look at the liver with ultrasound, but also look at areas and shoot uh, sound waves through these specific areas to see if they can measure the stiffness of the liver. Now, while that's not a perfect measure of scarring or fibrosis, it gets pretty close. And by measuring that liver stiffness, or what we call the elastography, we can better predict what kids might be doing and if their liver disease is getting worse. This was a study where we had uh, kids that were recruited who didn't have any evidence of liver disease, and then kids who were recruited that had autosomal recessive polycystic kidney disease. And for, uh, I believe it was 20 or so patients in each group. And they went ahead and looked at, uh, you can see here with the color codes, the left and right lobes of the liver. And so they measured uh, elastography or they measured that liver stiffness. Um, and then they measured the spleen in, normal, in the normal setting. And then they did it for kids with polycystic kidney disease. And you can definitely see that <coughs> overall, that liver stiffness is going to be a, a higher value uh, in these children. Um, and, uh, and unfortunately though, when you just take all comers, it may not necessarily be able to separate it out as there's some kids with ARPKD um, that have normal uh, liver uh, elastography values here. So if you, you know, if you walked in and said, hey, can you do that and tell if my kid has ARPKD or not, or if they have advancing liver disease, you certainly wouldn't be that confident. But what they found was that when they looked at an, a regular ultrasound and measured the size of the spleen, and then they looked at the platelet count, and if they had an abnormal ultrasound spleen size, and if they had a low platelet count, and then they did the elastography, that really separated kids out a lot better. So if we get values up, up uh, here in our kids with autosomal recessive polycystic kidney disease, especially in that left lobe, that tends to be pretty specific for, you know what, we've, we've got some complications of the liver happening. Um, and kids without any evidence of uh, advancing liver disease yet, um, that value was still elevated. So we know things aren't perfect inside those livers, but it was much lower than the kids who definitely had it. And of course that then compares to what we call the control group or those kids without any liver disease. So you can see these non-invasive techniques can discriminate kids who might have progressive disease versus those who don't. All right, so what else should we be ready for in this situation? Well, I haven't really talked a lot about autosomal dominant PKD because, um, well, it, it doesn't tend to affect uh, children uh, in substantial ways uh, like it can with adults. Uh, basically, there, there are a lot of things uh, that can happen with AD PKD. And we see, you know, heart abnormalities can be there. Um, uh, neurological abnormalities can be there. Um, but uh, from a liver perspective, they don't tend to get congenital hepatic fibrosis. They do, you do tend to see the possibility of developing large liver cysts, but those don't tend to have a lot of scarring. So things like portal hypertension really don't go along with them. So the chance that you might have, say, bleeding varices or ascites or a large spleen, much less with autosomal dominant PKD. Now, if your liver's got a big enough cyst in it, you can certainly have some belly pain. <laughs> that cyst can rupture, um, and things can happen that aren't necessarily desirable, um, but just not quite the same. Um, in ARPKD, we don't quite see the same number of complications outside of the kidney and liver that we do in ADPKD. They can still happen. Uh, the lungs can be poorly developed. The heart can have a, a hard time pumping against those poorly developed lungs. We can even see some aneurysms develop, but, but really what we're looking at is in, in if extra renal or non-renal complications of ARPKD relates to the liver, um, that we get these uh, liver cysts, that we get portal hypertension, and that we can get these esophageal and gastric varices to develop in the food pipe and stomach. Um, certainly it does make us sad though, uh, as far as uh, those complications in the tiny lungs. Um, and we know that uh, as much as I, I worry about the liver and things like that, pulmonary hyper Hypoplasia is a leading cause of death, especially in the, the younger children. Um, and that uh, long-term, fortunately, those lung effects are less of an issue. So while I've given you a lot of information about the complications that can happen in the liver, I do wanna say it usually really still functions. Um, 
And uh, there's things that we can do uh, to help it out if, if we do notice that it's in trouble. So if you notice, this is a, a lumpy, bumpy, uh, beat up liver. Um, and let's say we were running into a lot of trouble with a uh, big spleen. And if we talk about maybe they didn't mark it on this uh, illustration, but you know the, the stomach and the um, esophagus are missing here, uh, we can do some surgeries to help kind of reroute blood um, so that we don't see major complications like ascites or GI bleeding develop. We call these shunt surgeries. And in this one, the splenic vein goes down here into the renal vein, back here, and it basically bypasses the liver and goes to the heart. Um, that means that these varices, which are around your food pipe and stomach here, have, don't have to just go this way and get backed up, but they actually have another route going through the spleen and into this vein and down here into the renal vein that uh, allows them to escape. So when someone's having a lot of complications, whether it's GI, usually it's for us, it's usually GI bleeding episodes. Um, we, we will sometimes think about this, uh, especially if the liver uh, is, is, is doing a good job otherwise and, and functioning well. But uh, oftentimes, you know, the liver is so beat up that it doesn't make those shunt surgeries quite worth it. And we wanna talk about replacing the liver altogether. Um, and these can be due to a number of reasons. As I mentioned, GI bleeding can be one. Getting recurrent infections where you're always getting in the hospital because of big dilated cysts and the bacteria that can inhabit them um, is another reason you might wanna discuss uh, uh, transplantation with your team. Um, and then always when uh, the renal disease in ARPKD or sometimes ADPKD, if it's severe enough, you know, is it worthwhile to talk about doing a kidney and liver transplant at the same time? And like I said before, we know that if you do have congenital hepatic fibrosis, <coughs> oftentimes evidenced by that large spleen and low platelet count, um, transplant uh, does happen. And so out of a big group of patients um, with CHF, um, there have certainly been a lot of combined uh, transplants, a lot of isolated liver transplants and renal tra isolated renal transplants um, percentage-wise in these kids. And we know that uh, certainly if uh, you present earlier with signs of congenital hepatic fibrosis, the chance you make it well into your teens without needing any kind of transplant uh, becomes low. If this is, you know, 100% of kids have not been transplanted, we see that oftentimes, uh, you know, less than 20% of kids uh, get to live 15 years if they, if they come in uh, quite early with those uh, liver uh, disease presentations, um, that meaning in infancy, or excuse me, in the, with those neonatal presentations. Now, if they present later on in infancy or childhood, the chance that they get to live uh, uh, 15 years without needing a transplant becomes much higher, uh, circulating right there around 70%. So again, early presentation in infancy, uh, you do see a need for transplant uh, sooner rather than later. But if we do have to offer transplant, um, you know, we're, we know that the chance that that organ survives in a kid is quite excellent. Um, one of the things uh, that I've always been impressed with, especially when it comes to liver transplantation, is that in adults, if you get a liver transplant, we know that that liver on, you know, 50% of the time lasts about 15 years. Um, so 50% of the time, it can't quite make it that long, 50, and these are all adults, you know, so sometimes um, the liver expires with the patient, but 15, 15 years is about that, what we call the half-life of the liver. For pediatric liver transplant, so kids under, you know, anyone under 18, um, we have actually not yet been able to calculate a half-life, and we don't know about really where 50% uh, of all livers stop functioning, because more than 50% of all livers that have been transplanted are still going. Um, I can't speak to this enough, but we see kids that have been transplanted in the 80s that, you know, have gotten married, had their own kids, and are, are still going strong 40 years later. Um, and even in my own family, uh, my uh, aunt uh, had a liver transplant uh, 35 years ago. Um, and so she was uh, lucky to get one at that point in time, but at the same time um, has done exceptionally well with it. So we know that livers, especially in children, can go quite, quite a long time. Um, and that's just represented by these graphs showing uh, time in a, of survival um, for not only a kidney transplant, but liver transplant and, uh, and combined uh, liver kidney transplants. And these, are, these aren't patient survivals. These are if your graph survives. So your patient survivals are even higher than this. 
um, but they go quite a long time. And really, as you get out here, once you get to 10 years, you start to see this line flatten out, meaning that we're not losing any more of these graphs uh, or they're not lose, getting lost very often after that point in time, which is just excellent. And one thing we have to notice too, is that uh, transplants done before 2002 have a lower likelihood of graph survival than transplants done afterwards. And, and this is probably even better if we looked at more recent data. So just imagine that we're getting closer to 90%, you know, five, 10 year survival for, for some of our liver graphs um, in uh, kids with congenital hepatic fibrosis. So does this mean that my kid gets a normal life? Um, well, it's, you know, uh, I, I always like to say, yeah, I, I expect them to do things that, um, you know, regardless of the severity of liver disease that uh, any other kid would do. Um, there's bumps in the road for sure. There's medications that need to be taken, but uh, I, we always talk about, we do expect them to go to school, um, get a degree, <clears throat> go to college if they want to, get married if they want to, have kids if they want to, and that's uh, and have a career if they want to. And so uh, for um, the most part, yes. There are risks that go along um, even into adulthood, if, if, uh, it, even if things have been going swimmingly. We do know that when you have congenital hepatic fibrosis, um, that uh, lifetime of scarring kind of is like a lifetime of sunburns and can lead to cancer development in the liver. And we do see cholangiocarcinoma, which is a cancer specific to those bile ducts that can develop. Um, and, and so we, we always wanna be careful and continue to watch for that, never you know, lose, lose touch with your uh, friendly neighborhood liver doc. You wanna make sure to check in um, on a, you know, we do it here on an annual basis, but uh, at least uh, uh, on a frequent enough basis that they can uh, do some imaging and take some labs to look for that. Um, and that's especially important with cholangiocarcinoma because uh, you may not know that you have it until it's really too late. Um, you can see that it kind of grows around those bile ducts and when it's finally big enough to shut down the duct and cause jaundice and maybe an infection, Oftentimes it's it's so big that it's it's tough to remove. So you know, on that topic of normalcy, you know, how about uh, something uh, safe and healthy for kiddos, uh, like like sports? Can we do all sports? And when it, if you, if you really want to get technical, there's not a lot of data that says one way or the other um, what uh, you type of sports you can do and type of activities you can do. Um, there's documented cases of the spleen rupturing when it's too big in patients playing sports. However, most of these are due uh, in children, especially at least to Epstein-Barr virus. And so we'll have a, you know, a football player that got mono, which is the Epstein, -Barr, which is the name for the Epstein-Barr virus's uh, infection. Uh, so they got mononucleosis, they go out and play and they get hit really hard. And then they, they have a big splenic laceration and they bleed and um, it can lead to death even on the football field because of that. So a big spleen in general is not a great idea for uh, especially helmeted sports or severe contact. And, you know, it kind of makes sense. You imagine here, this is a normal spleen sitting nicely protected by your rib cage. It doesn't mean if you don't get hit really hard, it still can't rupture. But when that spleen gets big, it's dropped out really beneath the rib cage and beneath protection. And you can imagine that sets it up to get uh, cut or, or broken. Um, but, you know, if we look at... Uh, uh, abdominal organ uh, injuries in general, what sports are the worst for them? Well, we see the most number happen in, uh, in football for sure. Ice hockey's up there, um, basketball's up there. Um, but I, I really uh, do wanna say that um, the worst injury, the sole testicle injury in this report happened in softball. And so uh, all gentlemen should avoid uh, playing that so that you don't have to uh, have to go through anything like that. <laughs> Um, and when it came to liver docs, you know, uh, we actually had our own opinions about um, what we identified as high risk sports to most of our patients. Football was number one, hockey, wrestling. Um, some folks like to talk about skiing. You know, we don't talk about that much in Kansas City because of the lack of mountains. Um, some people rec don't recommend soccer. This is actually one that I do recommend for kids to play just because of the health benefits similar to basketball. Um, I do kind of think the sports that weren't a helmet is, is just kind of a good idea in general to avoid. but. Uh, you know, a lot of times baseball is a kid's favorite sport and we'll let them do that. Um, you know, in kids that do have portal hypertension uh, secondary to their chronic liver disease, uh, there was a, a great little study from uh, Philadelphia that said, okay, well, uh, out of all of our kids with portal hypertension, this is due to whatever disease, this isn't just due to congenital hepatic fibrosis, but what led to splenic rupture? <clears throat> and so they talked about, 
the nine cases of splenic rupture in their kids that led to shock. Um, and uh, the activities that were noted were falling off a horse, a fall while playing soccer, so not necessarily getting run into, um, but um, uh, a fall while um, playing, um, a sledding accident, um, falling from a cupboard, falling onto a tricycle handlebar, um, really basically stuff that, that happens in life. And, and so, um, you know, while we can maybe mitigate risk um, by, by avoiding helmeted sports um, or whatever, you know, criteria you or your providers may want to use, um, uh, oftentimes the, the things that bring you in are, are, are just the things like as innocuous as, as tripping and falling. Um, now that said, we do sometimes recommend for kids uh, and parents who are worried that you can get a spleen guard. Um, and you can see there how the, that's got some extra padding and can protect the rib cage area there. Um, there's no data to support these things yet, but if it does make you feel good, um, uh, I think it um, is a good idea for you to think about doing that for your kid as they play basketball or especially baseball. It seems like it might be able to stop a, a, a you know a softball or a, a pitch from coming in um, too hard to that spleen, um, and they do look pretty sweet. So. As we talked about, you know, we want our kids to play sports, you know, get jobs, go to go to school. What about having their own kids? Um, and the research isn't robust, but it's pretty promising. Um, and uh, we can, you know, there's case reports of even folks with congenital hepatic fibrosis um, having normal deliveries multiple times even. Um, and this is a good look at uh, patients who have actually gone undergone liver transplant um, and how they do. And we can see that they, they studied a, a bunch of these women and um, the APGAR score, you know, measuring the vigorousness of the baby at seven, uh, at five minutes was more than seven and nearly 100% of all babies delivered to folks who've had a liver transplant. There was very few premature deliveries um, in the group necessarily, though um, that 32 to 37 weeks may happen. Birth weights were really good, so we were, they were able to carry uh, uh, kids longer. Um, and and uh, importantly too, even though they may have been on some medications, no significant congenital anomalies were noted in this cohort of um, you know almost 60 patients that had a liver transplant. Um, they were even able to breastfeed. So I think this is just some uh, reassuring data that you know there's there's bumps in the road, there's things that happen, but um, in general the future is uh, going to be awesome, uh, and you you really want to maintain that positivity um, even in the face of some of these um, tough. Uh, you know, complications of uh, liver disease and, and kidney disease that you do deal with. Um, now, when we do think about the future, uh, positive things are out there. Stem cells are a big deal. I mean, these are things where you can take a cheek swab and, and retrain these cells to grow into something that might be useful, like, well, modeling a, a new, you know, a, a, a new kidney using using the reprogrammed cells. Um, uh, you know, you can, you can uh, potentially um, grow a, a kidney in a lab. Um, I think uh, three-dimensional printing uh, has given us uh, an idea uh, that this might be possible. Say that you put the scaffold together and then uh, retrain some cells and have them populate the scaffold um, with not only kidney cells or liver cells, but blood vessels supply that blood vessel cells that can supply them, bile duct cells that can drain them. Um, it's it's you know seems a little science uh, science fiction right now, but I think uh, could easily uh, become something in the future. <clears throat> Certainly it won't be easy um, uh, in the near future um, as, as we're, we're still taking a lot of time to, to make the models that we need. Um, and, they, and they may be a little bit confusing overall. Um, but we can definitely do some intricate anatomy. Uh, these were just some uh, uh, images of um, donor livers. Uh, done uh, and, and, and put together with 3D printing. Um, and you can see that they can do a pretty good job of, of putting in blood vessels and putting in the, the parts of the liver, very similar to what uh, was seen on images prior to these uh, donor livers being removed. Um, and I think those are impressive steps forward. We also can uh, edit genes now and have some uh, strong editing uh, capabilities where we might be able to go in into living patients or perhaps uh, even uh, gestating patients and uh, modify those uh, abnormal PKD1 or PKHD1 uh, uh, genes um, to, to help them grow uh, normal cilia and prevent the uh, signaling that leads to the abnormal cysts. Um, it's uh, done oftentimes by 
a cute blob, as it's illustrated here, named CRISPR, who can go in, um, open up the genome, and insert a brand new genome with uh, the brand uh, with the healthy uh, gene or or repair the defective uh, gene that might be there. And then in our lab, we even look at um, engineering uh, not just uh, the cells overall, but say for someone who has had a transplant, re-engineering uh, immune cells so that we can uh, prevent inflammation. Because you know what we know happens after transplant is that you get your new kidney or your new liver and your immune system immediately recognizes it as foreign and, and, and tries to attack it. And so you have to take medications every day to prevent that. Um, but in uh, our lab, we were able to take a type of inflammation called graft versus host disease. Um, and you can see in the purple line here, uh, drop our, our, our severity of score uh, by injecting one time uh, engineered cells that basically told the other immune cells in our mouse model to kind of chill out uh, so that they, they don't go running over and, uh, and do normal graft versus host disease and, and cause uh, the severe GVH. Um, so these are kind of some promising things where you can imagine if you can engineer the immune system correctly, you could take your own cells, transform them outside the body, uh, reinfuse them, and, and teach them or keep them from, from attacking that brand new organ, uh, perhaps even without the use of medications one day. So, you know, in conclusions, there are hardships, but they are certainly not insurmountable. And while, you know, these, these things, we, we, we take them on and, we, and they seem, you know, uh, scary and, and terrible at the time, uh, the overall picture should be one of hope, uh, I think, for, for every kid uh, dealing with uh, the polycystic kidney disease. And sometimes it's just all in the perspective, um, how, how you see these things go. And with that, I am all done. So I'm ready, ask me anything, uh, and the obligatory shot of Patrick Mahomes, the savior of Kansas City at this point in time, would uh, ask to close out our, uh, our presentation. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and I think that image there is probably uh, very exciting for those of us that may be in Kansas City. So thanks for, for posting that up there. Um, I know I speak for everyone when I say thank you. This was amazing information. And I bet you've already answered some of our questions, but we do have some. I'm going to go ahead and get started with those. But if you have additional questions, please feel free to type them in and we'll get to as many of them as we can. Uh, the first question I have for you is, do you recommend that a child with PKD be screened for liver problems? Oh, ab absolutely. Um, I think the, the method that uh, you use to go about this can, can differ from center to center. Um, but what we do tend to see uh, most ac across the nation is that usually a kidney doc will do a good job uh, drawing a CVC, which is uh, the lab that will give us our platelet count, and then they'll take a look at that platelet count. If it's greater than typically 150, they don't tend to worry too much. If it starts to sink a lot lower, especially less than 100, you begin to worry that the spleen is big <clears throat> and that that is evidence of advancing um, congenital hepatic fibrosis. Of course, uh, everybody likes to do a good abdominal exam, and you can sometimes just feel if the spleen is enlarged at that point in time. An ultrasound can be really helpful. Um, you might do those for the kidneys, and then uh, uh, if you do a complete ultrasound, that can get some of the other parts of the abdomen, like the spleen, where they can measure that. And as I showed before, you know, we tend to see that in kids who have a big spleen and a low platelet count, that really is suggestive that things aren't quite right with that liver. And those are, those are patients that we would certainly want to get into the liver doc. Here in Kansas City, we do tend to be just a little bit more aggressive. Um, I love to see uh, all of the ARPKD kids that I can. Um, and even if it's just a slight, you know, bump in liver numbers or bilirubin level or, you know, a slight low platelet count, uh, we, we like to bring them in and be part of the team as much as possible. Just because I think it's uh, better to be uh, prepared and answer questions than necessarily have something bad happen like a severe GI bleed or a bad infection of the liver and then have to come running in afterward. Okay, uh, next question I have for you. How often should a child without symptoms have an endoscopy? Um, that's a great question that we actually do not quite know the answer to. And so it becomes a little bit of a philosophical debate um, between different centers about what you wanna do. I've worked at uh, three different hospitals as, uh, you know, or actually four 
um, in the past two decades and everybody approached it differently. Um, currently in Kansas City, what we'll do is uh, when a child is referred to us um, with uh, ARPKD and concerns for congenital hepatic fibrosis, if we get a large spleen on uh, exam or ultrasound, or if we have a low platelet count, um, or if we've seen something on ultrasound, say a, a, a bumpiness or an unusual uh, characteristic of the liver, we will go ahead and do endoscopy uh, to look for those varices. Um, if we see them, we'll put the rubber band around them so that they don't bleed. And then we do tend to repeat our looks to make sure that they're not coming back too quickly. Um, and then it would be something where we would say, hey, every two or three years, we'll probably bring you back in to make sure these are doing okay. Um, there are a lot of centers that say, you know what, uh, we don't need to expose a kid to anesthesia um, necessarily in this situation uh, because oftentimes uh, they don't have a major bleed. Um, and if they do, um, we can at that time do the scope and then take care of it. Um, so that might mean that if you had congenital hepatic fibrosis and it was getting advanced and uh, you might throw up blood and, and come into the hospital, maybe receive a transfusion and then get your scope, but you could have potentially avoided a lot of, say, screening scopes before that. Um, it's, uh, you know, a lot of factors go into that discussion. Um, and again, we, we just try to talk to our parents to say, hey, listen, this is something where personally, if it's my kid, um, I'd like to know what what uh, the esophagus looks like, especially because, you know, that spleen is big or that platelet count is low. And I think it's a good time to take a peek and, and see if we need to do anything extra. Okay. So I'm going to switch gears a little bit. I have a question about nutrition. So this is from a parent that has a child that has ARPKD. Um, is there anything that we can do to support the liver, um, specifically omega-3 supplements, probiotics, or um, adjusting your diet in a certain way? That's a great question. And the, the short answer is the liver really just wants a well-rounded diet. Um, what we know is that uh, you wanna get sufficient calories. And oftentimes when your bile isn't getting out, you need to eat more uh, calories and fats than a kid who doesn't have liver disease. So, you know, uh, we might recommend 125% of recommended daily calories for a kiddo. Uh, to have good nutrition. Um, when it comes to supplements like omega-3s um, or herbals or, or probiotics, um, none of these have been shown to be helpful uh, to the liver. Um, they don't prevent the fibrosis from progressing um, that I know of. Um, they don't uh, you know, seem to help prevent any of the complications that we see. Now that said, um, there could be benefits that you, you know, may, may not uh, affect the liver appreciably uh, to our eyes, but could have good effects for your kid. Um, maybe they feel better if they take a probiotic or a fish oil supplement. And so in those situations, I think they, they can be helpful. Um, and they certainly don't harm. Um, from a dietary perspective, though, we do know that there is some stuff you don't want to do to your liver. Um, alcohol, uh, which hopefully our kids don't have to worry about too much, but as they get older, that certainly becomes a concern is a is a is a no-no when you have congenital hepatic fibrosis because it can make it pretty tough now that doesn't mean that if you have a you know champagne toast or a glass of wine that the liver is going to fall apart but it just means that um you know especially as they go to college uh that repeated uh, uh drinking episodes or been drinking or been drinking or disordered alcohol use those things are all all really really hard um and one you can't you can't do it um the second thing uh is we're finding out is that a lot of processed foods and sugars are pretty tough on the liver. And so uh, fatty liver is actually the number one liver disease in America right now for children. And it's uh, strictly related to diet and exercise in that um, kids who drink a lot of sodas and sugar juices, Gatorades, and who eat a lot of processed foods, candies, sugar cereals, pop tarts, snacks like that, fruit snacks even, uh, can cause the liver to store a lot of fat. Now we call it fatty liver. It's not actually related to you know eating bacon or steak or anything like that, but it's really it's related to high fructose corn syrup and and some of the ill effects that those things have on our body. So if there's one thing you want to do, it's uh, it's try to uh, avoid a high sugar diet and and sugary juices, and instead really go well rounded. We tell our parents to try and shop on the outside of the grocery store, so where those fresh fruits, vegetables, meats, you know, occasional dairy products, um, uh, uh, all sit. Those are and, and whole grains. Those are all great ideas for the liver. Um, 
there, you know, I, I didn't put any data in on it, but I will say there's a pretty strong push in the literature to show that coffee is beneficial to prevent liver cancer, um, up to four cups a day. Uh, most kids, uh, you know, wrinkle their nose when you're like, hey, do you want to, <laughs> if you want to really help out, try coffee. <clears throat> but um, most adults are, are, are thanking their lucky stars. They're like, oh my gosh, yes. Now it's gotta be black coffee. Um, if you go to Starbucks and get like the frou-frou, like mochaccino latte frappe thing, that'll, that's got a lot of sugar and that'll, that'll erase any good effect of, of a, a good black coffee. But um, coffee itself is, is thought to be somewhat protective against liver cancer. Okay, we're going to stick on this topic just for another minute or two. Um, I know you've mentioned fat soluble vitamins. So when do you decide if your child should take these vitamins and should these be only prescribed by hepatologists? Uh, no, I think a uh, multivitamin um, is a great idea at any point in time for the most part. Um, I, I can't think of anything from a, uh, you know, I, I suppose with advanced renal disease, you do want to be careful with some of the minerals um, and uh, that you're your child takes in, so I would want to clear it with their team. Um, for the really high dose fat soluble vitamins that we do sometimes use, those are available by prescription only. Um, but uh, any kind of provider, whether that's a kidney doc or a primary pediatrician or a liver doc, should be probably very comfortable prescribing those. It's easy enough to check for vitamin D levels and A levels and E levels in the blood when you're doing other types of routine lab work. And so you can see if it, your kid's sufficient or not just by looking at those simple studies. But um, in our liver kids, uh, we always recommend, uh, we never say a daily multivitamin hurts. It can only be, you know, for our perspective, it's only helpful. And then sometimes we do just have to really supplement quite hard um, hot with high levels of those fat soluble vitamins. Okay, very good. Thank you. Um, this is a follow up question to the endoscopy question we asked earlier. Once you have a normal endoscopy, when do you repeat? Um, that really depends on what we've had to do uh, in, the, in the past. If it's uh, your very first endoscopy and it looks really normal, we generally say two to three years in our program. So I want to make sure that I really highlight the fact that that is what we do here in Kansas City, um, and it may not be what your providers recommend. There is no data to say if someone's doing it better or worse than another person. And so when you, when you don't have data, you just have to do what you're comfortable with. I think this is always something that we uh, feel comfortable negotiating with parents. You know, if they're really uncomfortable with the idea of their child undergoing anesthesia, maybe they have a little residual lung disease or something like that. And the kid doesn't have too many other signs that there would, you know, of a large spleen or a low platelet count that would make you think those blood vessels are, are large inside the food pipe. We may certainly hold off. Um, if it looks normal when we do it um, and the kid is otherwise uh, seeming uh, to be robust and healthy, we may hold off again from, from doing it again while they're in our care. But overall, for our team here in Kansas City, a repeat scope every two to three years is generally indicated. If you get two, two normal, normal looking scopes in a row, you probably aren't going to get a third from our group, but it just depends on how things go. Okay, so I have a transplant question for you. Are there any transplant sites that are offering alternatives to anti-rejection meds at this time? There are not, no. Um, anti-rejection meds are essential uh, to a uh, good transplant, um, especially early on. Um, we have no way to control the immune system otherwise. And so, uh, you know, uh, we haven't found anything else that can t tell the immune system to stop working. Though, again, that's what my research focuses on is, is trying to train the immune system to uh, be a good steward to that donated organ. Um, it's it's going to take uh, years, if not really decades, to get to a point where we don't need to take medication to help our uh, liver and, and kidney grafts survive. Um, now, that said, um, the liver uh, is what we call kind of a tolerant organ. And so uh, down the road, um, we do note that kids, especially kids who've had transplants early in life, uh, uh, seem to get used to their liver a little more easily than, say, like an older child or an adult. And uh, there have been studies where, uh, in a controlled fashion, kids have been taken off of their medication altogether. Uh, at some point in time after transplant. And there can be success with that. Um, probably around 10, 20% of kids on immunosuppression right now could probably come off uh, and do okay. 
Um, we don't know what that means long term because these studies haven't been played out that long, but um, it might mean that there's some children with a genetic marker or an immune marker um, that we could look at that says, oh, hey, you you actually don't need to take medication anymore. You're good to go. Your, your immune system accepts this liver as your own. Um, but uh, that really needs a lot more study too. Um, I, that's ultimate where, ultimately where I'd, I'd like us to be is, you know, if we can't fix the genes before someone is born or, or, you know, make a brand new liver is to, is to really say, well, hey, why don't, we, why don't we get that immune system to back off, I'm, you know, specifically for that liver and, and function against everything else. I think that would be a really um, doable and, and, and possible uh, future step. Okay, thank you. Um, I know it's at the top of the hour and I want to be respectful of everyone's time. I've got one more question that I'd really like to ask, and this may be something that we could post a link uh, to more information, but I thought I would just uh, pass it by you uh, real quick. Are there any clinical trials about CHF with ARPKD? You know, that's a, a good question. I didn't uh, look at uh, clinical trials .gov before I uh, got on today. Um, and uh, that is uh, one of the places where you can find uh, clinical trials. Both researchers and uh, parents and families alike can can access it. It's a it's a government website. Um, there is not a lot out there, unfortunately, that I'm aware of. We certainly have registries where folks are looking at, um, you know, trying to collate as many patients as they can and. Um, study them over time to see what's happening and can we predict when things are going to happen like varices or like a GI bleed um, and, and do that better. But um, as far as, you know, new medications to help the fibrosis and things like that, those those aren't yet um, out in production, though um, I've got buddies uh, working hard in the lab to see if they can uh, modify fibrosis um, in liver disease. And, and hopefully that's something that does come down the pipe soon. Um, you know, but uh, that's why you know places like the PKD Foundation and, and other societies really need help because you know, with with uh, the research costs money and and to get you know to be able to supply uh, investigators with it we really really rely on on donations and and these wonderful foundations to support the work we do so you know I, I can't thank uh, you know the PKD Foundation enough and and other groups uh, for what uh, they're doing to advance science and, and the cause for all these kids that might be affected. Okay, thank you. Um, I appreciate you taking all of those questions. And if there is anything that we can post along with the recording uh, regarding research, we will definitely look into that. Um, that is all the time we have for questions. I want to thank you again, Dr. Fisher, for answering our questions and for all the information that you've provided. Um, uh, super fun. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we do want to let you know that the PKD Connect Conference is a national conference bringing all members of the PKD community together. Registration is open and we hope you will be able to join us to meet patients, family and friends, learn about disease management from medical professionals, catch up on the latest in research and explore PKD advocacy. We hope to see you in San Diego June 19th through the 21st of this year. The PKD Foundation appreciates the opportunity to provide you with the best possible education. After the webinar, you will receive a very brief survey. We appreciate your feedback and we will use your responses to develop future resources and programs. When you complete the survey, please include additional topics that you would like for us to address in future webinars. Please send any additional questions or feedback to pkdconnect at pkdcure.org and a member of the PKD Connect team will get back to you. On behalf of everyone at the PKD Foundation, thank you for joining us.